Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our panel on chemical weapons at 100. Um, let me introduce uh, the panelists on the panel, the speakers on the panel, in the order of how they are going to speak. First, uh, Dana Sacchetti to my right, who is a senior policy affairs officer at the OPCW. Then uh, Jean-Pascal Sanders, the trench, and also representing the FRS. And uh, the third speaker will be Eli Carmon, who is a senior research scholar in Herzliya, Israel, at the International Institute for Counterterrorism, the Interdisciplinary Center. And, in, uh, and I am myself, Elzsébet Rózsa from Hungary, the Institute for Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I was honored, and I am honored to be uh, to have been asked to chair this panel. So uh, our task is today is that our speakers uh, will speak for about ten minutes, not more. I will try to be very strict with them, and then uh, we will open the floor to questions and answers, remarks, and we sincerely hope that we are going to have a very good dialogue. So uh, without much further, uh, sorry, I was asked to say that uh, everything is on the record and it will be transcripted, as was said by Mark uh, in the beginning of the plenary session. So this, is, uh, this goes also for this meeting as well. And then without much further ado, please, Dana, you have your 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Ezebeth. Um At the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers of this consortium for the invitation to participate on this panel. Uh, our theme today, Chemical Warfare at 100, is one that holds great resonance for the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and its nearly universal membership. This year, the OPCW organized and participated in several events to commemorate the first large-scale use of chemical weapons that took place 100 years ago, little more than 100 kilometers from where we gather today. But rather, engage in an, rather than engage in a retrospective exercise, I will direct my comments to three areas today that are both timely and relevant. First, the current status of our mission in Syria. Second, a brief overview of our progress made towards global chemical disarmament. And third, some final thoughts on two key challenges facing the OPCW. Regarding the mission to eliminate Syria's chemical weapons program, quite a lot has transpired over the past year. You may recall that this time last year, with the backing of the UN, and the support of more than 30 of our member states, the OPCW successfully oversaw the removal of chemical weapons from Syria. Several EU member states contributed to this effort through technical and in-kind contributions. Since that time, we have verified the destruction of 98.9% of Syria's declared chemical arsenal. By the end of this year, we expect the final remaining stocks will be eliminated. And depending on the security situation, all declared chemical weapons production facilities will have been verified as destroyed. Yet despite the fact that 1,300 tons of Syria's lethal chemical stocks have been eliminated, two critical areas of activity remain in Syria. First, we are working to clarify Syria's initial declaration to the OPCW. And second, we continue to investigate persistent allegations of chemical weapons use in that country. Although these processes are ongoing, they have begun to render tangible results. Last month, the OPCW Declaration Assessment Team released its latest report that detailed several issues regarding Syria's initial declaration. Given the circumstances of Syria's accession to the Chemical Weapons Convention, there was very close attention paid to this issue. And in response, the Director General established a team of experts from within the OPCW to assist Syria to complete its initial declaration. To address these concerns, the team conducts interviews, makes site visits, and discusses open issues with the Syrian National Authority. This week, the team is on the ground for its 12th mission to Syria and will report its finding on any unresolved issues to the OPCW Executive Council. Regarding investigations of alleged use of chemical weapons, you may recall that the Director General established the Fact-Finding Mission, or FFM, in April last year in response to specific allegations of use in Syria. In September 2014, the FFM issued findings confirming the use of chlorine as a weapon in northern Syria. It is important to note 
that the mandate did not extend to identifying those responsible for the attacks in question. In response to further allegations coming from both the Syrian government and opposition groups, the FFM continued its work into 2015, and three reports were released last month. One of these reports confirmed that sulfur mustard was used in Marea, in northern Syria, in late August 2015. Now, identifying those who are involved in the use of chemical weapons is a critical step in upholding the global norm against these weapons, though this work sits outside our mandate as a technical agency. This past August, the UN Security Council adopted Resolution 2235, calling for the creation of an OPCW-UN Joint Investigative Mechanism, or JIM, to identify the perpetrators or sponsors of chemical weapons use in Syria. Arrangements for the mechanism are now well advanced, and it is expected to become fully operational later this month. Its first report will be issued to the UN Security Council and OPCW Executive Council within 90 days after it has become operational. Moving on, let me share some information on progress made towards global chemical disarmament. Earlier this year, the OPCW announced that 90% of declared chemical weapons had been verified as destroyed. Let me briefly outline the progress made by possessor states. The United States has destroyed nearly 90% of its declared amount of Category 1 chemical weapons, and it plans to complete destruction of remaining stocks by September 2023. Its two remaining destruction sites in Pueblo, Colorado and Bluegrass, Kentucky, continue to make progress to eliminate the remaining 10% of the U.S. stockpile. The U.S. is currently destroying problematic and hazardous munitions at an explosive destructive system at the Colorado site. This fall, the Russian Federation has completed operations at four of its five remaining sites, and only Kisner, its newest destruction facility, remains in operation. Russia has completed the destruction of more than 90% of its total declared amount of Category 1 chemical weapons. And like the U.S., all of Russia's Category 2 and 3 chemical weapons have been eliminated. Russia expects to complete destruction by December 2020. Libya completed destruction of its Category 1 and, chemical three, category one and 3 chemical weapons in May 2014. With respect to its Category 2 stocks, Libya has destroyed nearly 50% of this stockpile. Given the security situation, the OPCW cannot dis deploy inspectors to verify destruction operations, and therefore the OPCW and Libyan authorities have agreed on a set of remote verification measures that are being implemented in a consistent and reliable manner. Libya is scheduled to complete destruction by December 2016. Turning to Iraq, the prevailing security situation and the hazardous conditions at two storage bunkers in Al Mutana posed challenges to complete the destruction of the remnants of its chemical weapons. In cooperation with the OPCW and other states' parties, Iraq has decided on the most appropriate methods of destruction for the site, and progress continues to be made to finalize this process. The discovery of remnants of past conflicts remains an ongoing and unpredictable phenomenon, posing many states with similar challenges. In an often overlooked area of our work, the declaration verification and destruction of old and abandoned chemical weapons continue to remain a focus for the OPCW. Notably, China and Japan continue their cooperation in dealing with the historic legacy of chemical weapons abandoned in China by Japan. This work is ongoing and highly complex, and we continue to work closely with both states on the matter. So what does our progress in destruction mean? When we recall the origins of the Syrian mission, the global consensus reached in reaction to the use of chemical weapons in the midst of the Syrian conflict was significant, and a clear indication that the prohibition on the use of these weapons is a matter of international concern. In concert with the irrefutable political commitment made to this issue, we should also recognize the great financial cost in the tens of billions of dollars that countries such as the U.S. and Russia have financed to eliminate their own arsenals, not to mention the significant expense born of the Syrian mission. By early next decade, we will have eliminated all declared stocks of an entire category of weapons of mass destruction under international verification. Yet despite these great gains, there remain two important challenges facing the organization that I will highlight today. I must mention that this has been a fruitful year in our efforts to advance universality of the Convention, 
we were able to bring both Myanmar and Angola under the CWC tent, thereby increasing the number of states' parties to 192. <coughs> Yet we still have more work to do to convince the few states' parties remaining outside the convention to join the global norm against chemical weapons and to do so without delay. But in addition, we must continue to broaden our view on the mere concept of universality by seeing it not only in quantitative terms, but also in quantitative, qualitative terms. What do I mean by this? Of our 192 member states, more than 50 still lack adequate implementing legislation for the convention, several of which do not have effective enforcement capacity. These lingering gaps strengthen the OPCW's resolve to deliver international cooperation programs that strengthen national implementation of the convention. On chemical terrorism, we are operating at a moment unlike any other in the relatively short history of chemical disarmament. Hundreds, if not thousands, have recently suffered the brutal consequences of chemical weapons. And for only the second time in recent memory, non-state actors are alleged to have developed and used chemical weapons. The OPCW is deeply concerned about any use of chemical weapons, whether by a state or terrorist group. And though the convention was not necessarily designed with chemical terrorism in mind, we are taking several measures to narrow the permissive operating environments for non-state actors who seek to fabricate and use chemical weapons. I will list some of these. First, we're working to ensure that states' parties implement all aspects of the convention so that domestic laws are enforced to criminalize and penalize any activities prohibited under the convention. Second, we are intensifying our work with international organizations and through the 1540 Committee to close gaps and prevent terrorists from obtaining dual-use materials and technologies. Third, we must augment our links with industry and law enforcement to encourage the tracking of toxic chemicals through supply chains, thereby inhibiting the black market trade of scheduled chemicals. Fourth, by convening working groups, such as the OPCW Working Group on Terrorism, we are promoting dialogue among our member states and enhancing assistance to prepare for and respond to chemical terrorist attacks. And finally, we must remain vigilant in our response to any allegations of chemical weapons use. This is perhaps best exemplified by our rapid response to investigate allegations of use in Syria and further demonstrated by our recent deployment of experts to Iraq to look into allegations of chemical weapons use in that country. Across all these efforts, it's abundantly clear that realizing a world free from chemical weapons will not be possible if we do not cooperate with each other. It is vital that we share information, exchange best practices, that we build a more secure future together. For only through such cooperation can we strengthen our nonproliferation regime to ensure our disarmament achievements are sustained and made permanent. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana, for this uh, very interesting and Uh, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to talk about uh, potential for uh, chemical weapon disarmament in uh, the Middle East. Um, to lay out uh, a number of the issues, uh, I think it's very important to bear in mind that uh, since the Second World War, all major incidents of chemical warfare, with the exception, say, of the Vietnam War, uh, have taken place in the, the Middle East. And uh, usually the Middle East is defined as a cleavage between Israel and uh, the Arab uh, peoples. Uh, in that respect, uh, it's interesting to say, and that's quite a big uh, contrast in relationship uh, to nuclear weapons, uh, that is, uh, chemical weapons have nothing to do with Israel. All use has been Arabs against Arabs, Muslims against Muslims, or regimes against their own population. And it's uh, an interesting aspect to think if we want to push uh, chemical disarmament uh, in the Middle East. I've organized my uh, remarks uh, around four points. Uh, I must be brief, but I hope uh, that they will uh, enable you to uh, put some uh, questions or, and have uh, discussions uh, on them. The first one is uh, the CWC. Is it uh, a viable instrument uh, for the Middle East? Uh, there are 
essentially uh, two states not party to the Chemical Weapons Convention in the Middle East, Israel and Egypt. However, I will come back uh, to that uh, later on. We also have to consider the state of uh, Palestine, particularly since uh, last February it has joined uh, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and more and more it's uh, behaving as a, a state in the international system. Uh, one does not um, invite a state to join uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention. It is something that's done of a free uh, volition of a uh, state or a state actor. So um, where are the big problems? Well, the first one, if we look at Egypt, is that uh, its position with regard to nuclear disarmament in the Middle East, particularly referring to Israel, is key. And as long as there is no movement in that particular area, uh, Egypt is, in fact, unwilling to consider uh, any option relating uh, to joining either the Chemical Weapons Convention or the Biological and Toxin Weapons uh, Convention. With regard to Israel, there are a number of factors uh, complicating uh, the matter there. And the first one I would say, the general political context right now is uh, definitely one. Uh, there is a feeling of uh, great tension and uh, insecurity, and joining international treaties are not uh, very high on uh, the agenda. Added to that, even if the circumstances uh, might be uh, more conducive, to uh, engaging in discussions to join the CWC. Uh, one still needs to address a general lack of confidence in international institutions. Um, added to, to that is the great debate that uh, takes place in uh, Israel, whether uh, peace and security in the whole of the Middle East has to precede any joining of international uh, conventions. So, the question uh, really is, whereas uh, people such as myself, the OPCW and so on, would like to push joining the Chemical Weapons Convention as a contributing factor to creating stability in the region, the perceptions of uh, Israelis in that uh, respect are quite different. And then the fourth element uh, with regard to Israel is uh, civil society. And while there are a number of uh, people and civil society organizations with interest in uh, chemical weapon disarmament, one cannot escape uh, the feeling that they see it much more as a stepping stone to uh, nuclear disarmament uh, for Israel. In other words, they don't see it as a goal in uh, its own end, and therefore they do not commit the resources to mobilize the population in terms of uh, getting interested in joining uh, the Chemical Weapons Convention. Now, the other uh, angle to disarmament in the Middle East is, of course, uh, the zone free of uh, non-conventional weaponry uh, in the area. And here the question is uh, how to progress. Generally, the attitude uh, has been, uh, okay, uh, let Israel, Egypt uh, join the Chemical Weapons Convention. It's almost presented as the low-hanging uh, fruit, and then uh, people can actually focus on the hard nut of uh, nuclear disarmament. From the perspective of uh, the zone, if this is the approach uh, to be taken, I'm personally not even convinced that the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, is the best approach to achieve chemical disarmament in uh, the Middle East. Uh, as already said, all other states in the Middle East are party to the Chemical Weapons Convention. If Israel and Egypt are not party, other issues uh, play a role, as I have uh, already uh, explained. So the question is, can a number of steps be uh, designed uh, to get those two states closer together and gradually build uh, confidence that they are meeting the obligations as laid out in uh, the CWC? A number of possibilities are uh, available. One aspect uh, I think uh, uh, that would be really useful is to try to get a small working group of technical experts uh, together but uh, I have found this is uh, quite complicated uh, to get together because most of the people 
participating in the discussions are what I would say more political operators rather than uh, technical uh, experts. And the idea is to build epistemic communities between the different uh, societies that then, when uh, discussions on the zone could actually take place at some point in the future, that they would be able to put forward concrete proposals to get over political psychological uh, barriers. Uh, another element uh, that might be a, a possibility would be for Israel and uh, Egypt to start a number of uh, activities in accordance with uh, the procedures led out in the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention. In other words, it would be a, a case of unilateral transparency, actually making a number of statements that they are uh, that they do not possess chemical weapons, that they are not developing or producing them, and doing uh, the types of uh, reports as a kind of uh, a CBM. Of course, there wouldn't yet be uh, verification in uh, the first instances, but, you know, civil society, international uh, experts could start looking at those uh, documents, raise questions, and over time, uh, again, experts could get together who, who knows uh, certain proposals for bilateral uh, inspections on an informal basis uh, could follow. Uh, the third point I wanted to touch upon is uh, Palestine. As I have mentioned, it has uh, ratified the MPT. Uh, the big obstacle from the point of view from the OPCW, I think, to engage uh, Palestine uh, directly and uh, actively is that threat from the United States to defund international organizations uh, that uh, Palestine joins. As I've mentioned, it's not up uh, to the OPCW to invite uh, Palestine. Palestine can do it by itself. On the other hand, uh, I wonder if uh, that particular threat in the case of the OPCW uh, would be so great in the sense that, yes, uh, the United States is the bigger single uh, payer contributor to the OPCW budget. On the other hand, can the United States really afford to be uh, for, well uh, denied participation in decision-making processes uh, inside the organization? I, I don't think uh, this is uh, possible uh, for the United States. So one would probably have to feel one's way uh, around there. A critical issue that might uh, come up is uh, one of substance, and uh, that's the extensive use of tear gas and uh, other chemical agents uh, in uh, you know, the exchanges between Israeli soldiers and uh, Palestinian uh, activists. The problem is uh, that, uh, yes, you know, uh, from Israelis' uh, point of view, it could be argued uh, this is uh, domestic law enforcement uh, and the various uh, aspects uh, related uh, to that. However, from the Palestinian side, uh, they view the territories as being occupied. In other words, it's a state of war, and it creates a totally different uh, interpretation as to the use of uh, those agents. That's probably an issue that needs to be uh, explored further. And then the final point are a number of uh, the challenges, and one aspect is uh, obviously what's happening in uh, Syria. I'll be very brief. Uh, I had several points, but uh, I'll be very brief. One uh, thing that I want to say is uh, that the OPCW will have to realize that in its uh, 18 years or so uh, since entry into force of uh, the convention, um, many more people have been killed from chemical weapon use in conflict than in the 40 years of the existence of the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention. In uh, the case of the latter convention, fewer than 100 people were killed through deliberate disease since 1975. In the Chemical Weapons Convention, we're probably already talking between the two and the 3,000 uh, people killed, and there is still ongoing use. It is good to have uh, all these investigations on the ground going on, but the key question is, how much longer can they go on? I mean, what can the OPCW do beyond establishing whether chemical warfare agents uh, were used or uh, not. This is uh, an area that really concerns me in terms of uh, eroding uh, that uh, convention, and particularly 
uh, in relationship uh, to the theme of uh, disarmament in the Middle East with uh, Israel uh, and so on. There are lingering questions. The OPCW has a diplomatic code of being careful in uh, what it says. It cannot attribute uh, responsibility. But where does it go on? The United Nations Security Council has uh, created JIM, the Joint Investigative uh, Mission, with the responsibility to attribute uh, responsibility in the cases of uh, use of uh, chemical weapons. However, this is just a, a platform for action after the war is finished. This doesn't save a single person during the war, and it doesn't stop uh, what's happening uh, in the war. And this is uh, really a hard nut uh, in my mind, that uh, the international community will have to uh, address uh, because uh, clearly this is not a situation that any of us, at least I, I didn't expect, to live through in uh, the context of the implementation of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very honored uh, to speak to such a professional audience, and I would like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, for the first time at this uh, important conference. Uh, the title of my presentation is From Stage Chemical Warfare to Chemical Terrorism. And when I'm teaching my students about terrorism, I say this hour after lunch is the uh, most difficult hour to fight terrorism. So I hope that we will overcome <laughs> this hour. Our institute, uh, uh, the International Institute for Counterterrorism, in cooperation, strategic cooperation, with the French think tank CREST, today the uh, Fondation de la Recherche Stratégique, has conducted a comprehensive and comparative research on CBRM terrorism at the end of the 90s. And uh, just before 9-11, when we finished our uh, work, our evaluation was the terrorist organizations active at the time, including Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, the major Palestinian uh, groups had no capacities to stage what we called annihilation or what we called weapons of mass destruction attacks, only tactical minor attacks, but this could have strategic, political, social, and economic consequences. From the 292, 292 incidents that we found in the three decades, 70s, 80s, and 90s, incidents and not attacks, okay, half of them were threats, okay? From the 42 real attacks, 35 uh, were chemical attacks, and we evaluated that chemical terrorism was the most probable and the most immediate threat because the knowledge terrorist organizations already had about chemicals and explosives. So I think also that uh, there are also operative uh, reasons for this, but they, we don't have time perhaps to enter in this. Uh, this is why the chemical terrorism was the most uh, plausible. Uh, the number of chemical incidents and attacks rose significantly after the Iraq-Iran war and the second Gulf War against Iraq. It became evident that uh, this kind of uh, warfare, chemical warfare, influenced the Aum Shiriki leader, Soho Sahara, and the leaders of Al-Qaeda to conduct research and stage chemical attacks as a copycat phenomenon to imitate, but also give him some kind of legitimacy because states used chemical warfare without, by the way, paying the price. Uh, this trend did not change after 9-11, uh, and we had only uh, one attack of anthrax in the United States in October 2001, uh, which is not, probably was not an organization for the most, uh, what we know, it was one person, uh, individual plot, uh, devised uh, with unclear goals and uh, motivations. The Aum Shinrikyo sarin attacks in Matsumoto in June 94, and the Tokyo subway attack in March 95, and the failed cyanide attacks after dismantling of the cult were the most serious chemical terrorist events since the, we know about them. I would stress that the Matsumoto sarin attack was actually much more dangerous and sophisticated, but because the attack in the subway was uh, so publicized, it became the symbol of the passing of the taboo of using chemical and, was, if you want, weapons of mass destruction in terrorism. Uh, it should be stressed that almost all Qaeda's, Al Qaeda's chemical terror plots failed, beside 15 chlorine attacks in Iraq from October 2006 to uh, June 2007. But they themselves decided to stop these attacks because they arrived at the conclusion that suicide simple attacks with explosives were more effective, and part or great part of the chlorine was destroyed during these uh, suicide attacks with chlorine. Uh, but the real change in our threat assessment about the threat of uh, 
chemical terrorism came after the uprisings in Libya, Syria, and Iraq. Uh, the discovery of the mustard gas Libyan base in 2011, the chaos in Syria as a result of the civil war, and the fall of some chemical defensive material and possibly agents in the hands of jihadist rebels, and the ISIS conquest uh, of the huge Al Mutana chemical facility in Iraq rose the specter of their use by their, these terrorist elements. Uh, the Syrians' uh, regime use of tactical chemical attacks, first of all, Sarin in the famous uh, 2000, August 2014, uh, 14, 13 attack in Al Ghutal near Damascus, and the use of chlorine during spring 2014, in our evaluation, were kind of tactical attacks in order to achieve military strategic gains in very important strategic uh, points for the Syrian regime in Damascus area on the one hand and the Aleppo area on the other hand. But th at the same time, they give some kind of legitimacy to the rebels to use the same weapons, uh, at least in their eyes. In July 2014, ISIS used chemical agents, probably mustard gas, against the Kurds in Kobani before the main battle, before the great attack on Kobani. One of my colleagues in Israel, which is a researcher in the Middle East and is also a journalist which visited several times Syria, he received from the Kurds the first photos of this attack. We analyzed the photos, at least not the material, but the photos in Israel, and we arrived at the conclusion that this was probably a master gas attack. Since then, several other attacks with chlorine and master gas have been staged mainly against the Kurds in Iraq. Uh, Salih Jassim Muhammad Falah al Sabawi, Aku Abam, uh, Abu Malik, a chemical weapons expert who joined ISIS in 2005, was the first major ISIS operative killed in January to uh, 2015 by a drone attack by the United States. And this is very interesting that the first real attack against a senior operative was against a chemical expert. He was known as a mid-level ISIS fighter who provided means for production of chemical weapons, and he had worked at the Mutana famous uh, facility, uh, chemical facility. Uh, I would close this uh, short presentation by raising several questions for discussion. How much of Syrian chemical agents and devices have fallen in the hands of the rebels, taking in consideration that in 2013, much of the fighting was on the fence, on the fence of the famous or big uh, uh, Al Safira uh, Safira uh, facility, which, by the way, was defended by Hezbollah, which says that Hezbollah also had uh, the possibility to use some of the uh, agents in this facility. And in these days, the regime tries to liberate part of the uh, territory around Al Safira, and the ISIS succeeded in stopping them, and is also, again, very close to the fence. We don't know exactly what remains in Al Safira facility. And uh, uh, how much uh, chemical agents, shells, and facilities remained uh, usable in the Mutala chemical uh, weapon production facility? Uh, there is a lot of uh, 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 co conflicting information about this. Perhaps we'll hear from the uh, uh, experts here. And I think very important th uh, issue: how uh, or what happens with seven seven hundred Iraqi? biologists, chemists, and nuclear physicists, which were arrested in 2003 when the Americans entered Iraq and were liberated, to the best of my knowledge, after one year. We know already that the backbone of the military infrastructure of ISIS are Baathist and Sudanist uh, officers, and we saw the example of, of Abu Malik. I ask myself what happens if 10 or 15 of these experts, uh, including the biological field where they are very advanced, could uh, uh, recruit themselves or be recruited by ISIS. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to all three panelists. I think many issues were raised, and these uh, ending questions by Ali were especially provocative, uh, since these are uh, very practical and very much uh, on the ground questions, um, especially these issues that we do not know what happened with the rebels and uh, what happened to the Iraqi biologists and chemists. But I would like to encourage you now to ask questions, make remarks uh, uh, regarding uh, all the topics that were, challenged, that were raised here, be it the OPCW, but I think here, Donna, maybe you can also answer some of the questions that were raised. Or, uh, so the floor is open. Yes, let's go into this yeah, order. That's a microphone. Yes, there is a microphone, so please come here, the first row. Yeah, one, two, 
Mark, you are the third, and then Richard the fourth, and then yeah. we, will, we go further. No, he is not a king, but still Richard will be the fourth in uh, <laughs> the line of questions. Okay. Um, a four short to the king from one time from uh, and hung a bit. Uh, in terms of the problem of compression of the we uh, can't chemical disarmament, uh, I wondered why there was no mention of the, of the perennial problem of updating schedules. We live in an age of ever increasing technological advancement, chemistry and biology, and that seems a rather important background problem. Um, then, have, is there a sufficient attention paid to the structural problems of trying to prohibit chemical weapons uh, when, when one chemical user may be the client of one of the P5? The, the attribution problem there seems to be insuperable, doesn't it? Um, we've heard somebody who is not a, on the uh, OPCW and therefore is allowed to speak as an expert and an individual saying it is clear who committed the Guta massacre. But nobody in OPCW could say that. Nobody in the UN can say that. And uh, a, a chemical massacre which a provincial police force could clear up in the morning um, goes unaddressed by the international community. Now, uh, this has got certain problems, hasn't it, in an age of false flag uh, accusations and uh, the proliferation of terrorist groups who clearly are unworried about stigmatization um, and yet may not be responsible for doing particular attacks but can be blamed for that. Isn't this going to be a rather serious problem, hand, how to handle this sort of fa fast-moving, small-scale, um, murderous, uh, provocative attack? This is not what was foreseen in the Chemical Weapons Convention. I remember I was involved in it. And it may be something that the OPCW and its, in its institutional position in the world is not at all suited to handle well. And I wonder how that could be improved. Well, thank you very much. I'm Rogelio Firpe. I was Director General of the OPCW between 2002 and 2010. First of all, I would like to thank the speakers uh, which uh, keep alive the flame of chemical weapons as an issue of the uh, importance to international community and security agenda. Uh, Dana Saketi has given us, I think, a very comprehensive and good presentation about the status of the uh, Chemical Weapons Convention and the OPCW work. Like Professor Schulte, who is one of the founding fathers of the Chemical Weapons Convention, uh, I also am intrigued about how does the organization at this stage approach the issue of new emerging, uh, the possibility of emerging chemicals, uh, convergence between uh, chemistry and biology, and therefore the threat, the potential threat of um, new poisonous uh, synthetic materials that could uh, uh, not been, have been foreseen by the Chemical Weapons Convention in its schedule. Um, there is also the issue, uh, which I think is important, at least in, in my view it was important, uh, the commitment of the United States and Russia has always been crucial to the success of the Chemical Weapons Convention. Um, the fact that uh, one will not complete the destruction until 2020 and the other one 2023, uh, we all know they are well committed, but I think that that issue um, is one that uh, uh, sort of opens a question mark. Uh, when one joins that together with um, issues that uh, could affect the credibility of the Chemical Weapons Convention, as mentioned Mr. Sander. I think we, we need to keep um, a, a close watch on developments and therefore put pressure on governments uh, and issues. The issue of universality is also crucial to the success of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And I, I, I was a bit taken aback by Mr. Sander's suggestion that it's not to the Chemical Weapons Convention, but rather to um, uh, track two engagements that um, the chemical issue can be approached in the Middle East. I think that the absence of, of law uh, as defined by the Chemical Weapons Convention is the one that opens the gates for the sort of uncertainty Mr. Schulte mentions, and I believe that yes, the Middle East is the crucial area in terms of chemical weapons. And yes, we should try to determine responsibilities, but our ability to determine responsibilities is diminished if we do not have at least some sort of legal framework that regulates the conduct and behavior of states on, 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 that, on that front. So I will stop here. I just wanted to um, uh, raise these issues and ask uh, 
this schedule has to fit the issue of, of um, you know, making progress. Thanks for uh, good presentations. Unlike Paul and uh, Rogelio, I'm not a founding member of uh, anything to do with uh, chemical uh, weapons, although I am a founding member of the EU Nonproliferation Consortium. <laughs> Uh, in the last two conferences, um, we, we featured uh, the uh, success of the Syrian operation. Uh, we applauded the um, Nobel Peace Prize awarded to the OPCW. There was a lot of positive uh, mood, atmosphere. I mean, questions were raised appropriately about attribution issue, which, uh, as Paul said, remains unresolved. But, you know, there was a, there was a, a sense of accomplishment. And uh, Dana has furthered this by noting the uh, movement further toward universalization. Uh, but we have this uh, continued use of chemical weapons, and, and uh, Jean Pascal uh, uh, expressed his uh, concern about the eroding of the convention. I think it's what you said, the eroding of the convention. Uh, I wonder if I could press you on that. Is it the eroding of the convention or the eroding of the norm that uh, had uh, seemed to uh, have so much momentum behind it, the norm of non-use at this uh, hundredth anniversary of the use. Um, Rogelio, um, I want uh, mentioned the need, uh, the importance of universality, and uh, perhaps I could um, back him up by asking uh, a question to Dr. Carmen, as a, a citizen of one of the two nations that uh, is uh, outside the treaty in the Middle East. W whether there is any scope for um, uh, Furthering the universalization, um, is it and and is a is one of the issues the accusations that sometimes are made that Israel at one point had chemical weapons and might have had a stockpile and it's never been acknowledged. Is this a is this a problem uh, that would have to be uh, that you see as a, a stumbling block to Israel uh, acceding to the treaty? The the question about past uh, development and uh, maybe even accusations of current. Stockpiling. Uh, thank you very much. A couple of sort of bullet point uh, things, and then uh, on something more substantive. Uh, Dana, just the, in terms of the use of the word "released," uh, I would just like if you can clarify because. Uh, sometimes within OPCW, people refer to released as we've distributed amongst states parties, but it's still confidential. Uh, whereas many of us regard released as a public document. And uh, I would, uh, since you, you mentioned the uh, declaration assessment team and the fact finding mission reports, uh, I certainly the, sec the latter I'm pretty confident have only been circulated to states parties. But if you clarify that. Uh, second is in response to um, something Jean Pascal said about the. Um, U.S. being the biggest single contributor. Uh, of course, we're in the EU meeting, and if you add up the EU contributions, uh, certainly when I last tabulated it a few years ago, EU, U.S. contributed 23%, uh, um, Japan about 12%, and the EU 38%. Uh, so we shouldn't forget that from an EU perspective. But I want to come to a more substantive point about the Middle East, and I think the characterization of the Mid Middle East mostly is Israel versus the rest loses a whole set of issues here because of um, certainly Iran-Iraq war. But more importantly, what happened in the 60s... Sorry? Well, I, that's what I'm just coming to. The 1960s in Yemen, which I think is so crucial. I mean, it's, it's 50 years since the change of uh, the head of the Air Force of Egypt, who was very keen on the expansion of the chemical weapons program and the use the greater use of chemical weapons that ended up happening in 1967, and that was a chap called Hosni Mubarak, who I'm not sure what he later did. But Hosni Mubarak, as the head of the Air Force, was very, very keen and on expansion of the chemical weapons, both in the number and in their use, which led to a range of attacks in 67 that were seen as, as significant within the context of the Yemen civil war. And I think far more than, than the Egypt Israel axis. It's the Yemen civil war that really set the tone, and that's the great difficulty. And as a last point, though, to come back to Egypt and Israel, we're on the record, so I mean, I, I know some people may not want to speak, but there is something very interesting in the Egyptian program continues rising until the Camp David Accords and suddenly falls away. 
and there's often been speculation as to whether there is something that was secret, so where some, some bilateral arrangement mediated by the US in some kind of agreement. And I just wonder if people are looking at further progress, uh, especially on the Egypt-Israel axis, whether there might be uh, some confidential basis to, to build further action on. I would like to stress the fact that the use by states gives legitimacy to the terrorist organizations to use chemical weapons. And this began, by the way, in the first uh, World War. The Germans began, by the way, the, the first be began with the French with the tear gas. And I, I ask you, tear gas is a, considered to be a war, uh, a war of cri crime uh, against humanity if you use tear gas? You mentioned Israel, they use it by Israel of uh, tear gas. I don't uh, knew that the tear gas is considered to be a chemical uh, weapon. Uh, Sorry? But against ma uh, manifestation? I mean, s s protests, okay? Okay, so in the case, as in the uh, war between Iraq and Iran, actually nobody, including the attack on Halabja, no real international uh, reaction to these attacks. And uh, now with the Syrian attacks, again, we are three, four years already in the conflict, and nobody has decided that the Syrian regime or has accused the Syrian regime that they used chemical weapons, although it's clear that uh, their, their arsenal was enormous. We published the day of the Russian-American agreement a uh, very comprehensive report about the 45, 50 facilities that uh, the Syrians had at that time. Uh, and here I come at the, at the, uh, the issue. I think uh, somebody which followed a bit uh, uh, this, this issue, from the beginning it was clear that the uh, Syrian regime will cheat. And there were, I think, two or three phases uh, since they declared all of it, and probably not all of it. Because this was, by the way, in my opinion, uh, plan uh, by the uh, Iranians. The Iranians convinced Bashar al-Assad with the Russians to dismantle the chemical arsenal in order not to, uh, to lose the uh, uh, grip on, the, on Syria. And uh, the, the fact, by the way, the United States achieved this agreement after the August attack with the 1,400 uh, casualties was considered by all the opposition, by the way, by all the opposition as a betrayal by the United States, uh, President Obama personal, and the West. And uh, uh, a month after this uh, agreement, there was a huge coalition, which was consisted of 11 organizations, but actually hundreds of small groups, including ISIS and al-Nusra for the first time. Then it uh, was uh, dismantled because this, uh, Saudis became afraid of it. But uh, to understand how the action of states and the great powers influence also the decision by these uh, 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 organizations to use uh, chemical weapons. Uh, about uh, Israel, I think that, uh, uh, again, I'm not uh, an expert on these issues uh, on the strategic level from the point of view of Israel. Uh, I think that uh, Israel has uh, considered uh, uh, all the, uh, I would say, all the means of defense because of the uh, Holocaust remembrance and uh, because of uh, what we uh, uh, suffered during all these uh, five years, five wars uh, actually, and, uh, uh, and only lately four uh, special operations in, in Gaza. Uh, the, I think the, the strategic decision by the Israeli leadership was to follow a, a policy of ambiguity, okay? This is the four, mainly in the nuclear field, but also I think probably in the other fields. Uh, what is uh, perhaps, uh, why perhaps now there is a moment to, to tackle this issue with uh, Israel is the fact that Syria, uh, all, even if there is no complete dismantling of the uh, arsenal, clearly uh, Syria is not what it was uh, two years ago. First of all, the army, Syrian army, practically does not exist as a threat, strategic threat. Uh, and the chemical arsenal, 
uh, was uh, uh, most of, of it destroyed, and we know that there is, a, there is a decision by the Israeli army not to give masks to the citizens. It was this project, which was very expensive, was stopped. So perhaps this is a moment to, to uh, uh, approach the Israeli government, although, as I said, the, the, first of all, the regional context is not so uh, positive. And the internal, uh, I, I wouldn't speak about it, but still the politically internal uh, context in Israel, which is a very uh, uh, complex coalition and very unstable. So again, I don't know if uh, Israel is able to, uh, the Israeli leadership is able in these moments to uh, 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 receive a strategic decision of this, because we must remember the Israeli accepted, the, uh, but it did not sign, but it did not ratify it, okay. And the uh, uh, Israeli Knesset parliament today, it's in a shambles, I would say, from the point of view of the coalition, so I don't know how they can uh, pass it through the, the parliament now. Yes, thank you, Jean-Paul. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the comments. Uh, first, in uh, reply to Richard, yes, uh, I agree with you that if we take all the EU countries together, plus the joint actions and so on, the EU is the biggest contributor. This is why in my presentation I said uh, the U.S. the largest single contributor uh, to make that uh, distinction. I mean, the EU, uh, whatever we may think of it, it's still not a party to the Chemical Weapons uh, Convention uh, there. But, uh, yeah, the, you, you have a point in a certain uh, respect. Uh, Mark, um, uh, a couple of uh, points in uh, reply to uh, your questions. Yes, I agree. Uh, I mean, uh, I express uh, concern uh, about the CWC and the OPCW. That still does not diminish the accomplishments of the OPCW in Syria in extremely different, uh, difficult circumstances. The, the point uh, that I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, uh, after the great hurrah of the Nobel Peace Prize and so on, the perception, and I emphasize the perception, could come to the public that there is a steep decline of uh, effectiveness uh, after that uh, supposed. And uh, my appeal is uh, actually much more to the state's parties to be uh, creative uh, in their thinking because clearly what's happening in Syria knocks against uh, what I would say the outer perimeter of what the Chemical Weapons Convention can uh, establish. It's not the fault of the OPCW, it's just the fact that the convention was designed in a time when expectations and visions of chemical warfare were completely different from uh, what we are experiencing today. Just to give you one example in relationship uh, to uh, ISIL, uh, what happened in Iraq, what happened in uh, the Maria uh, area. You know, I'll try to express it uh, clearly. It's the use of a chemical, toxic chemical agent by a non-state actor against another non-state actor on the territory of a state party which is not under the control of that state party. Now, just try to imagine that particular legal uh, system. I don't think any of the drafters of the Chemical Weapons Convention imagined uh, such a, a situation. These are the types of challenges uh, we have. The investigation that's uh, currently going on um, in Iraq or has uh, just been uh, accomplished. Uh, you know, uh, the Iraqi government wasn't particularly interested in having it uh, investigated. It was the DG who, you know, had to lean on uh, the Iraqi government to actually be able to fulfill the mandate uh, that he was uh, given under the terms of uh, the convention. It's these types of things. But as you can see, uh, a lot of disarmament today is not uh, driven uh, uh, by, you know, the type of technical expertise that was uh, current in the 70s, 80s, and uh, 90s. The agenda is being driven by human rights organizations, uh, humanitarian considerations, and so on. And these people have different expectations from uh, investigations going on. And because of the different discourse, it could lead to perceptions of ineffectiveness. Let's not forget that, uh, you know, the chief executive officer of Human Rights Watch, after the Ghouta attack, his first tweet he sent out was a call on the United States government to go and bomb the Syrians. 
you know, uh, to, to me, that is burn the village to save it, but, uh, you know. Um, to, uh, you asked me on uh, the eroding of uh, the Chemical uh, Weapons Convention and the norm. Uh, to a large extent, uh, today, the Chemical Weapons Convention embodies the norm. It's not the sole keeper of the norm, obviously. There's still the Geneva Protocol and uh, a variety of uh, other uh, arrangements. But the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, is uh, the keeper of it. When I speak of uh, the erosion of the CWC, it's perhaps less uh, the norm as such, although it's uh, obviously also affected. But if people start doubting uh, the value of the annual contributions, the investments of resources they have to make day in, day out, to be in full compliance uh, with uh, the convention, they start doubting the effectiveness of the organization. How long are they going to continue to be willing to do that? And it's a, a gradual process, but it's uh, one that could, uh, over time, uh, seriously erode the value of the convention. The day that people start losing confidence in compliance by other states, that people start doubting the effectiveness of the various uh, uh, reporting uh, obligations, uh, the verification of those reporting obligations, that's when uh, the whole system might uh, start uh, falling apart. And then we just have uh, the shell. Now, I, we're still not there not yet. Uh, no, no, far from. But it's just if one thinks over 10, 15, 20 years that one might start uh, seeing uh, that particular type of uh, process uh, happen. And that's where I uh, have my concern. Your, your other question about the Middle East uh, there, uh, Israel and uh, Egypt, uh, Richard has already uh, referred to it with uh, respect to uh, Egypt. Yeah, I mean, both countries have had past uh, chemical weapon uh, programs. Uh, I don't think uh, there is uh, much doubt about it. Uh, I personally believe that both uh, have stopped the programs uh, a while uh, ago already. But, you know, your question is exactly what the problem is. There are lingering doubts uh, about it. This is also one of the reasons why in my presentation I mentioned people could start, <laughs> both countries could start with a number of unilateral declarations, perhaps not verifiable uh, initially, but it would be uh, a process of generating transparency and uh, confidence uh, in uh, the region. Me, Egypt, to the best of my knowledge, it had uh, uh, a major chemical weapon production facility outside Cairo. Uh, Sadat uh, shut it down. And uh, today it's uh, a pharmaceutical uh, company uh, in that uh, particular uh, location. Israel, uh, you know, the most uh, recent lingering doubts we have is still that El Al plane crash in Amsterdam, uh, near Amsterdam. You know, three of the four precursors of sarin were on board that plane. I mean, not enough for a serious chemical weapon program, too much, for, I think, for the Israeli explanation that it was for defensive purposes and testing of equipment, but it would be good to, to start getting uh, that type of uh, transparency going. And if I may, I just wanted to comment on um, Illy's uh, comments here. I think what we've seen in Syria, we have to put it in uh, perspective. You know, the success of the Chemical Weapons Convention uh, means that we have gone down from 40,000 uh, agent tons, 30,000 uh, agent tons. Because of that drawdown, all of a sudden, 1,000 tons becomes a huge uh, thing. The same is with uh, the success of uh, the OPCW in dismantling Syria's uh, program. We are no longer talking about sarin and mustard agent. We're talking about chlorine. I mean, this, uh, while uh, it is completely wrong that there are still chemical weapons attacks, no doubt about it, but we also have to put in uh, perspective what the nature of uh, the threat is. Things today are big because what used to be big is gone. In the case of terrorism, you know, the Chemical Weapons Convention, the thinking of a military arsenal was in thousands of tons. Uh, once the CWC came in place, Iran, Iraq, I mean, a few thousand uh, tons, but mostly in terms of uh, hundreds of tons, 
in the case of terrorism, we're talking about kilograms. I mean, we, we have to see, uh, have a certain perspective that uh, the threat has been uh, diminished. The other thing to bear in, in mind is, um, yes, the, uh, the Syrians, the locals, the opposition, uh, they were disappointed with the priority given to chemical disarmament. Uh, and there are two reasons for that. Uh, but let me first po point out that the cost of the dismantling of Syria's chemical arsenal, as the OPCW has done it until today, is the equivalent of the purchase price of three F-16 fighters. Put it differently, bombing, the bombing campaign currently going on, costs $10 million a day to sustain. That means in about a week and a half, the amount of money used to dismantle serious chemical weapons would have been uh, used up. Would people have been safe from further chemical weapons attacks? No. Bear in mind, until today, the negotiations that led to Syria joining the Chemical Weapons Convention is the only diplomatic effort that actually has worked in that conflict between 2011 and today. I think we have to bear these uh, elements um, in, in our head uh, when we uh, talk about it. And the final point I wanted to make uh, about that uh, betrayal, you know, after the First World War, but during the First World War and after the First World War, um, the opposition against chemical warfare started far away from the front lines. It was in Canada, it was the United States, and it was in the Netherlands. And also it involved one group of people who were non-combatants, women. But for the people in the front line in Belgium and France, chemical warfare, the exposure to agents, was one nuisance among so many. They, you know, whether it was rats, rain, disease, uh, and so forth, chemical weapons, they lived in it day in, day out. And to me, uh, it's quite recent, uh, my insight, but uh, to me, for the people experiencing the war in uh, Syria, they have exactly that same feeling. They have bombs, they have shells, they have terror all the time, and chemical weapons are just one. So from their perspective, they would probably not understand why. So, uh, you know, there is some education to be done there too. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, Ellie would like to make a very, very quick remark. And then yeah. Uh, I agree with Jean Pascal that uh, this is important uh, that uh, Syria has been the dismantle of chemicals and uh, it's, it's really seen as a very important uh, uh, development. Personally, I wrote uh, during the visit of President Obama in Israel in March 2013, six months before the agreement, to our leaders and proposed such an agreement uh, in order to dismantle under international, uh, international uh, control and uh, ensure the survival of the Alawi community, but without Iran. And here, and you see it today, Iran has been the, the big winner uh, of this kind of, uh, uh, if you want, uh, strategic uh, understanding with Russia on the uh, Syrian uh, file then and uh, now. Thank you. Dan. Thank you very much. Um, just to your question earlier about the release of reports to states parties, whether it's the reports of the declaration assessment team or the fact-finding mission, you are indeed correct. Well, I am talking about a release um, of the information directly to states parties. Um, the Director General does submit these reports on a monthly basis to the UN Security Council and UN Secretary General, but they are not um, typically released to the public. That said, these reports are often leaked, um, and a simple Google search um, or involvement in, in uh, the, the, this community and discussion with colleagues can sometimes um, um, elicit you in, in, in the ability to find such reports. Um, it was an honor to receive a question from a godfather of, of the Chemical Weapons Convention and a former Director General. Um, I've been with the OPCW for about six months, so you'll forgive my uh, ignorance on the issue. But, but the, the issue of um, the development of chemicals um, and, and the rapid speed at which um, chemicals are, are, are invented um, is one that, that poses great challenges for the organization. It must have been this uh, during your time. Um, and, and is still so today. Uh, it's estimated that there are 1,500 chemicals um, that are uh, invented on, on a daily basis. So with our, our meager staff uh, and capacities at our uh, laboratory in Reichsweig, um, we simply cannot keep up um, with this rapid speed of, of development of, of chemicals. 
This does speak to the importance uh, of continued and enhanced engagement with the chemical industry, uh, which is an important area that we're pursuing further um, in, in, the, in these days uh, at the OPCW. Um, the industry uh, component uh, is quite important. Industry um, is important not simply for the verification of activities, um, but also we are, we're working with uh, leaders in industry um, to push uh, the idea that as a good corporate citizen, it's incumbent upon them to work with us to ensure that chemicals are not used and developed for dual use purposes. This is something that um, uh, we're paying very close attention to uh, here in The Hague. Yeah. yeah, I'm Martin Scott, uh, National Focal Point for EU CBRN from Liberia. <clears throat> My question goes uh, to us. Um, depending upon the fact that OPCW relies on funding from uh, interest parties, the question is, will... OPCW say no to a decision of such a party. Second question is, who determines which nuclear arsenal to be dismantled? Is it a decision from OPCW or the uh, interest party who is not uh, a friend to such a state actor? owning such a facility. So my second question will go to uh, Dr. Common. Uh, listening to your presentation uh, aroused my doubt whether uh, the continuous, the paradigm shift in uh, uh, condemning the actions of non-state actors against state actors is uh, real. Um, you've been able to condemn the Syrian regime and the, the usage of uh, chemical weapons. But I never heard you mentioning or condemning the actions of the non-state actors. And knowing that the non-state actors include terrorist groups, uh, does that further legitimize the, um, the possession and usage of uh, uh, chemical uh, CBR and uh, weapons of mass destruction by non-state actors friendly to the powers that be? Thank you. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, I'm Dimitri Liopoulos. I belong to the External Action Service, uh, the um, Security Policy Department, and I'm uh, the uh, EU representative in The Hague to the OPSW. I'm uh, the first one of the kind which shows exactly the increased interest that the EU is taking on the subject. And I consider me as a precursor to a full-fledged delegation that uh, <laughs> whenever the budget <laughs> will be uh, established, then, um, uh, then the, the, uh, the issue will be followed uh, in a much more consistent way. Um, now, two issues, uh, because we heard a lot about universality, and I have to stress that uh, this is a top priority for us. And in fact, we take some pride that uh, we had uh, two accessions this year, and maybe by the end of the year we'll have a third one if things uh, go uh, well. Um, and this is not the um, product of uh, the hazard, I would say, because uh, in parallel to the OPSW demarches and the letters of the DG, uh, we have made also um, demarches as a EU uh, through our EU delegations to the respective countries, and I think that uh, at the end all this, the conversion of all these efforts gave uh, fruits. Of course, uh, then even if uh, South Sudan accedes that we hope that it will, uh, because there it's easier, um, just by a letter to the uh, Secretary General they can uh, succeed, uh, they don't have to do anything more drastic than that. And we hope that, again, I repeat, that it might happen until the end of the year. Um, then uh, Israel and Egypt is a, is a, is a more difficult case because uh, we have been uh, repeatedly uh, lobbying them, and to, just to get the... Um, 
almost the same uh, answer that the, the times are not, uh, I would say, suitable, convenient uh, for such a thing on, a, on, a, on various accounts. Uh, but however, uh, I mean, my point is different. Uh, it's again that we, on every single opportunity, we uh, lobby them because we point uh, to the importance of what they will do and then we reverse the argument just like uh, Jean-Pascal has said. That, uh, I mean, we, we, instead of uh, seeing it that if everything else, uh, especially the nuclear part, uh, falls in place, then it will be propitious for the others to do, uh, to, to also to move into the uh, direction of the CWC. The problem is uh, that uh, we consider that even with that, that it might pave the way of easing uh, tensions uh, and making a little bit more, uh, perhaps, uh, when the time will come uh, to, to move into other dimensions of the uh, WMD free zone in the Middle East. Uh, so when, even this month, we have political dialogues with both countries, and we, will, uh, we have included them in the uh, speaking points of the negotiators. Um, now, the other thing is that, uh, and this is also a question that I would like to put uh, to uh, the panelists, is that uh, we are witnessing the start of a thinking process uh, for the future of the organization, which is uh, changing uh, we, we, uh, its role, I mean, for the post-destruction era. And this is a, I mean, one can argue that uh, this is not going to happen soon, as because uh, if the, the declared stockpiles, uh, the Russians will be terminated by 2020. The, the, I mean, if the, uh, we hope that they will stick to that uh, time schedule, and then the Americans on the 2023. However, uh, the OPCW, and we appreciate, they have uh, published a, a very interesting note on the role of the, um, of the organization in the year 2025. And I, we think it's topical, and as you, I can assure you that we have started uh, giving a thought to that. So if we have something to discuss, perhaps at the fourth review conference in 2018, uh, which is not too far away, then uh, I think by that time we, we should have been given adequate thought. So I would like to have the take of the panelists, perhaps, on, on that particular issue. Thank you. Thank you. My name is John Hart. I work at CIPRI. Just to make a short comment to follow up on one point that was made by Dr. Carmen, uh, Israel signed the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty and it also signed the Chemical Weapons Convention. And as a consequence, it contributed to the development of managed access provisions, including, for example, um, use of blinding software for yes no answers. So this can be understood as um, a certain level of engagement, but also a means for helping to keep open the door, one's option to join at a later point. And perhaps there could be some discussion that follows on from that. Thank you. Hello. Then I am the last one to... Uh, no, he, sa he said oh. that he okay, doesn't okay. want. But you, you signaled to me that you don't want to, right? Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so just a couple of questions and thoughts. I would like to uh, compliment and, uh, to what Dimitrius said. Uh, in Central Europe, I have been to several discussions and there this question was already raised. What role for the OPCW after, after the, uh, in the post-destruction phase and after hopefully sooner or later uh, every country accedes to the treaty? So uh, this was one question. The other question was, um, we have been discussing here the different cases of use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime, but I am wondering if, uh, if uh, we are paying attention to the local press, because all, uh, all in the local press, there have been indications in the Turkish press, Lebanese press, the Iranians were saying that they sent message to the United States through back channels, that at least some uh, opposition groups uh, are in possession of Absolutely. some chemical weapons. So, uh, and it is English language press, so it's very, not Arabic and not Farsi, so it's quite easy to, to read. I checked some of them myself. I didn't want to believe my eyes. So what would you say on that? Um, and then uh, it's fine that uh, we are discussing here Israel and Egypt, Egypt, Israel, and Jean-Pascal, you referred to the fact that, okay, there is also the nuclear weapons, 
but, in, uh, but to raise the asymmetry and the complicacy of the issue with regard to the nuclear weapons, of course it is not Egypt, Israel. It is Israel, and Israel considers Iran and looks at Iran, even after the nuclear deal. So it is, uh, it is uh, uh, very complicated. And, uh, and I think the, these were the things that I wanted to so, uh, just one more, just one more remark. With regard to, uh, Dana, what you said uh, to the uh, relations with the industry, uh, let me share with you a very short anecdote maybe. At one point I had to do interviews in Hungary with people in the export control office, what they are doing with regard to the chemical, uh, especially it was the chemical uh, material. And then I said, now come on, how can you check on it? And, uh, and the head of the division said, oh, come on, we know all the chemists in the country. Uh, this was not long after the regime changed, so things were changing fast, but still there was the personal knowledge of practically everyone. I don't know what he would say today if he was asked about that. Thank you. Um, on universe, just to your questions, you were asking about the, the funding uh, of states' parties for OPCW activities. Um, all states' parties contribute to the OPCW. Uh, there's not a selection of states that, that uh, fund the OPCW's activities. All states' parties fund the OPCW. Exactly. All states' parties. I know. My question was directed to major state parties. Has to give more input yes. in the uh, proliferation or disarmament. Yes. Major state parties. You mm -hmm. know, I know Somalia contributes. Yes. It's insignificant to your existence. Mm -hmm. So, major state parties. Mm -hmm. We talk about the EU states, mm -hmm. the US, mm -hmm. Japan, Russia, and others. Mm -hmm. If they have an opposition to or an input at stake, will OPCW take a neutral position, an opposite position? States' parties rotate uh, their membership throughout the OPCW Executive Council uh, every two years. So states' parties are able to exert their influence in the decisions that are made by the Executive Council uh, on a rotating basis. There's no question. There's no question. So the states' parties that contribute to the OPCW are assessed their contributions in line with the UN scale, um, full stop. Um, that said, I would also add that there are numerous international cooperation activities that are funded by, by in large part, these major donor states' parties. And these work uh, all over um, the, the world, in low and middle income countries, to enhance the domestic implementation of the convention. So states parties such as Liberia and Somalia, states that you've mentioned, are able to take advantage of many of these programs in ways that the high income countries, the, don the major donors to the OBCW do not. And the EU. And the EU. Thank you. And we do, we do appreciate the, the lobbying efforts uh, of the EU uh, and other states in terms of advancing universality of the convention. Um, on South Sudan, uh, we do expect to have some movement. Um, there has been intensive lobbying that's taken place um, from the OPCW and other states' parties, both on the ground um, in Brussels and also in Joba. Um, obviously, there are competing um, um, interests right now with all that's going on um, in South Sudan. Uh, you may be aware of the, e the uh, African Union High Commissioner report recently that detailed the human rights uh, violations, allegations of human rights allegations and atrocities in the midst of that conflict, so it's very low on, on South Sudan's agenda. Um, I will also mention we've talked about the, the three states that are not yet party to the convention. Um, the fourth, uh, North Korea, we have not had um, substantive engagement in North Korea um, on this issue. They've basically not um, answered any of our um, uh, demarches or re requests for uh, discussion on the issue of the CWC.
Um, thank you very much. I, I think on that uh, question, uh, Donna has given uh, a, a full uh, answer there. <coughs> the only thing uh, perhaps I would like to touch upon is uh, a point that actually uh, you have uh, raised about uh, who is responsible for the chemical attacks in uh, Syria. Um, it, it is known that uh, a number of uh, attacks uh, can probably be attributed to uh, actors other than the Syrian government in uh, the conflict. And, you know, um, it, it has been in, in the press uh, all over. Uh, Middle Eastern uh, reports, yes, uh, they have uh, mentioned it. Uh, but, you know, just like any reporter, we have to be cautious. We have to verify whatever uh, ca comes out uh, of that. Um, the, uh, the interesting uh, thing is, at the end of uh, October, um, you know, the uh, fact-finding mission in Syria has produced uh, three reports, which is currently circulating internally uh, inside. And uh, one report deals with the mustard agent attack in uh, Maria, and basically the report confirms the use of uh, mustard agent in uh, of which one baby uh, died. A second report uh, deals with uh, the allegations of chlorine use in uh, Idlib uh, province, and basically uh, the report uh, concludes that there is uh, evidence that a chlorine-based substance uh, has been used as uh, a chemical uh, weapon. Uh, the, re the reason why they mention substance is uh, simply because, uh, you know, there are certain other contaminants uh, included, uh, inclu uh, including uh, bromide uh, and so forth, which probably uh, is a reflection of the production uh, method. But then there is uh, the third report, uh, an investigation requested by the Syrian government in a location just outside uh, Damascus, and there basically uh, the report uh, concludes that there was no use. So in, in other words, the one instance where the Syrian government actually requested an investigation uh, into alleged use by a terrorist organization that could not be uh, confirmed. You know, uh, I think it's uh, telling. Now, having said that, uh, with respect to use by particularly ISIL, uh, there is uh, an evolution uh, visible. Uh, first and foremost, it's um, what I would call opportunistic use of industrial toxicants. In other words, they capture something in a factory or a storage uh, site and then somehow they put it uh, in uh, improvised grenades uh, and so forth. Um, that, that is uh, one aspect uh, of what we're seeing with ISIL. However, uh, while there is development in terms of delivery systems, uh, we don't see much development in terms of uh, weapon uh, agent uh, development. The mustard agent is still uh, a big question as to where it uh, comes uh, from. So this is uh, essentially what I've said. There are many indications of use by uh, ISIL, but you have to get your uh, grip on it. Uh, and again, with all the caution that is necessary. Thank you. Uh, just one, one point of correction, John Pascal. The, the um, allegations that were made by the Syrian government the report that was released um, at the end of last month. Um, this investigation is ongoing, and a final report will be issued by the fact-finding mission in early next year. So that report has not been conclusive in its findings. Uh, yes, to the question that uh, I did not condemn <laughs> the terrorist organizations, I, did, I mentioned that uh, these organizations are using no, specializes. Sorry? And are using and using. Uh, if you ask me if uh, ISIS will be influenced by some kind of uh, uh, international uh, international uh, uh, reprobation, you see how they kill, uh, assassinate 200 children in uh, half an hour. So it's not an organization that will be influenced. If you ask me, I'm st studying the terrorists, but with my counter-terrorism hat, okay, I think that what should be done is to uh, take action operative action in order, if they have this possibility, to uh, neutralize them. This should be done by international community. Those which are, there is a coalition fighting in, uh, in uh, Syria and Iraq. Huge coalition. What are they doing? And uh, we must dif uh, differentiate between uh, some opposition groups which perhaps uh, some uh, precursor or agents have fallen in their hands and they are able to stage something very primitive and ISIS. ISIS, as I said, they have uh, 
first of all, a strategy, a territorial grip, huge territorial grip. They control uh, facilities which clearly could be used also, excluding the petrochemical industry. And uh, they have, for sure, uh, specialists from the uh, Saddam Hussein time which are able to use shells, artillery, bombs. By the way, this is how the uh, Syrian regime uses it. The Syrian regime does not use uh, uh, some kind of precursor. They use uh, uh, military uh, hardware. Thank you. Have I left anyone without a chance to speak? Uh, yes, Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Is it up? Yes. Uh, I, I, I think there were a, a question about the role of the OPCW after the destruction phase, but I understand, I, I, and maybe I, I do not, I did not understand the, the or hear the, the answer about that. I, I uh, can, of course, understand that uh, uh, the role of the OPCW after the destruction phase has to be thought, has to be defined. And, and there are uh, several years from near to 2023 for that. But what would be, uh, in your opinion, this is uh, mostly a question for you, Mr. Saketic, what would be the, um, let's say, uh, 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 provisional uh, uh, steps uh, in that uh, uh, strategic thinking process within the OPCW, and not only within the, the organization, but with the men uh, 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 funding, funding states and the EU uh, particularly. Thanks. Just a short one. From what I understand, there's, there's been a deliberative process that's been taking place for some years. It didn't just start this year or last year that was looking at the future of the organization. Um, the, the release of this um, discussion paper, the OPCW in 2025, was just one one uh, additional step that's taken to spur discussion among states' parties. There are retreats that are held among ambassadors um, in The Hague to discuss the future of the organization. Um, this is an iterative process. It's clear that the organization will continue to implement the, the provisions of the convention well into the future. What that looks like, um, we're not quite sure yet. It's clear that there will be um, a, an increased need uh, for education and outreach um, to encourage those that are, um, um, that are going to take the, the convention uh, into the third and fourth decades of its life uh, to make sure that the, the, the aims of the convention are, are upheld. Um, so what shape that takes, we're not quite sure yet, but it's something that's being studied quite closely um, within the OBCW. About the issue of Egypt and Israel, uh, I think that uh, we should uh, uh, divide between the nuclear issue and the other issues. Because on the nuclear issue, Egypt has always been the most uh, extremist, uh, anti-Israeli state, uh, Arab state, uh, in asking uh, uh, to dismantle uh, the uh, Israeli uh, uh, possible uh, nuclear uh, infrastructure. And uh, so I don't think that uh, uh, the Israeli uh, position on the nuclear issue will change uh, anytime soon because of what we see uh, in the region and clearly after the Iran uh, uh, deal. Uh, and this, uh, in spite of the very good present strategic uh, cooperation between Israel and uh, Egypt, uh, especially on the Sinai, especially about Gaza and so on. Uh, thank you very much, but I have okay. already spoken so much. <laughs> With that, then, I would like to close the panel and please join me in thanking our panelists for their presentation.